my task today is to uh, get everything set up on the bench and running uh, before I start working on the actual shot bot itself. I'm running with a new camera today and we'll see how that works out. Uh, the first thing I need to do is, or the second actually, is I need to get some labeling printed. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Let's see, we're doing cable wraps. And the diameter is about, yeah, that's pretty close. Okay, let's see what we got here. That's waste. And then, oh, that's really small, but so I don't know if it'll focus on that. It might. That says X1 axis on it. And then I've got three more of those tiny things. And I will spare you the print of the rest of them because that's just not fair <laughs> an interesting thing i discovered when unboxing all of these is there's three of this style driver the 1008 and there's only one of this one which is an 800 or an 808 so I think uh, the point is to use this one for the Z axis or Z axis and these for X and Y. So that's what I'm gonna go ahead and do. Let me get these labeled. I need scissors. Scissors, I need scissors. Slide all the way over here. Slide all the way back. And I'm going to change glasses because I can't see what I'm doing. See? Labeled. <laughs> Next is X2. You know, one thing I really don't care for with these brother labelers is the amount of waste that they generate. Especially with how much brother charges for original tapes. Um, it's kind of ridiculous. So in protest, I only ever buy cheap third-party stuff off of Amazon because while the Brother hardware is excellent and the prices are good, the cost of the consumables is just ridiculous. This printer is really kind of cool. It, it has modes for cable wraps and flags and face plates and all kinds of stuff. And uh, it makes wire documentation super easy. This is what I kind of mean by waste. So this is what kicked out first. And this is the label that I printed. Okay, it basically, when you're printing one label, it doubles the, the amount of tape that you process. And that's kind of stupid, but it is what it is, I guess. 
And I'm not a fan of the off-center printing, but that's probably correctable. I just can't be bothered. <laughs> I'll just trim the stupid label down. Um, I decided that I am going to retain the uh, uh, axis orientation that the ShopBot currently has, which means the uh, the long axis of the machine is going to remain X, and the short axis is going to remain Y. One thing I need to investigate is hooking this thing up to a computer and using it that way. Um, I've known it's had the capability for years, but I just haven't gotten around to trying it out, and I really should. I got this done earlier in the week as far as getting uh, getting ferrules on the wires. And I don't know how well you can see that, but there you go. Anyway, um, I had some discussion with, uh, with Gary, the guy that I got this stuff from, regarding uh, what kind of connector to use on the, uh, the cable exits in the box. And his recommendation was is that due to past experience with uh, connectors arcing internally, um, he recommended that I just use uh, an appropriate sized cable gland and direct wire uh, the steppers uh, to the controller. So that is the task I'm doing, um, or that's the, the, the procedure I'm going to follow, um, and is why I'm putting crimp ferrules on the cabling now. Um, I will not be uh, cutting the cables to shorten them or anything else like that. I'm going to go with the standard length and uh, That they come with And that will give me a little flexibility about where I'm going to put my control box um, I thought about mounting it where the shop box control box is now uh, But I may not do that Okay, got my ferrules and my crimper. I was looking at online at uh, uh, some uh, Weha and Nipex. I think it's Nipex, isn't it? Yeah, I think. Uh, feral crimpers. And the prices absolutely blew my mind. The, uh, the crimper that I have right now came with a kit, this thing here, that I paid, I don't know, 30 bucks for. And I've seen the, the ferrule uh, crimpers themselves on Amazon available for you know, anywhere from as little as fifteen dollars to twenty-five or thirty dollars for the the off-brand manufacturers, and both Weha and Nipex uh, are apparently incredibly proud of their tools uh, because the the least expensive feral crimper I found on Amazon uh, for the Nipex ones were, damn it, screwed that up. I'm going to make sure that you don't have any stray strands and I screwed that up. Anyway, the least expensive Nipex one on Amazon was $158. Now, 
I'm quite sure that their quality is very good and I've heard nothing but good things about their tools. But come on guys, 150 bucks for a tool like that? I mean, yeah, it's, it's a good tool, but is it that good? I mean, I could understand if it was doing multiple stage crimps like uh, Molex tooling or amp tooling does where they've got multiple complex dies inside of a single tool that crimps at different diameters and force and things like that. But I mean, come on, this is a stupid crimp ferrule. If it was rocket science, they wouldn't make perfectly adequate tools for 15 bucks. So yeah, I don't know. That's just my opinion and opinions are like assholes. Everybody has one. And this asshole has an opinion. <laughs> Well, yes, I am a comedian. No, I'm not. I only think I'm funny. Everybody else knows I'm not. Anyway. I was very happy to see that the, the video dump that I did a while back with all those videos in a couple of days garnered me some 20 or 30 new subscribers which just blew my mind. So welcome to you new folks that have found a new and exciting way to waste your time. <laughs> Seriously, your, your viewership is, is uh, very appreciated. Okay, that's the last of that cable type. Let's look at the encoders. Something tells me the encoder is going to take it down, of course, and it's a... It's not a Ziploc bag. Okay, let's see what we got here. And I really... Oh. So I think that is a 28 gauge wire and it's been tinned and that really, really upsets me. Um, damn it. Well, that's how the manufacturer did it, so I'll stick with it, but I'm not happy about it. My complaint is, is that these are going to be crimped into a, a bootlace ferrule. And when you compress a soldered wire, uh, you can get a failed joint over time. Um, with heating and cooling cycles, the, uh, the wire can loosen inside the, the connection. And I don't know if it'll be that big of a deal with this in just as a signal application, uh, but if there was, you know, significant power going through those, I would absolutely cut this off and redo it because you do not put a tinned connector uh, into any kind of compression terminal or or bootlace ferrule if you're pulling power through it uh, because it will eventually fail guaranteed it might take a while but it will fail um, and when you're pulling power that kind of a failure generates heat and when you generate that kind of heat you end up with a fire and that's no bueno I bought the 28 gauge ones that I'm gonna use on this 
originally for the uh, the sensor wires or the the end stop sensors on the print NC machine because I wanted to use a good connection. I don't know if you can see how tiny that is, but I'll lick the end of my finger to make it stick, right? So that's how tiny that thing is. He's really small. Oh, I have 26 gauge too, but we'll see how this works. I mean, it gets the job done. I'm not going to pull it really hard because it's delicate wire, but you get the idea. Putting these into the crimp terminals is going to be so much fun. Said nobody ever. But fortunately, the crimp terminals unplugged from the stepper drive. It moved when I crimped it, so it may be a problem in the future. Okay, I wanted to also point out that these cables have a shield drain wire right there, this thing here. It's not connected to the other end here, it's just connected to the shield drain inside the, the cable. And when this is mounted in the box, I'll need to, or before it is, I'll need to solder an additional wire to increase the length, and that will go to the grounded chassis inside the enclosure. Uh, and the point of that is to help with noise reduction on the cable or noise suppression i should say because cnc environments are electrically very shouty <laughs> they make a lot of noise and the best way to handle that is by using good wiring practices. And part of that is connecting the shield drains of your cabling to ground. You don't want to connect it all the way through to the end device because you run the risk of a ground loop that way. And that's bad. And if you don't know what a ground loop is and you really want to know what a ground loop is, Google it. <laughs> Suffice to say, it's bad. It allows voltage to be where voltage ain't supposed to be. Next task I need to be working on is getting the breakout board, which connects to the acorn like so, hooked up to some wires, but I need to take these posts off because they are not, I'll show you what the problem is. You can see what I'm talking about. See the nuts banging into each other right there. This side should have, if it was to be screwed down, should have screws, not lugs there. So let us, in the piece of information I need may not be in the manual. It may be online. I think it's a schematic online, so I'll have to go grab that. So I've been doing some documentation and planning of my build here. Um, as I get further into it, I learn more and go, okay, I've got to stop doing what I'm working on because I need to account for this, and that's great. Um, it's going to make for a much better build when it's done. Um, I did discover I was short some wire, and so I had to order some six conductor wire, uh, and that's not going to be here until tomorrow. But again, my first plan is to do a wire up of everything on the bench with tape on the drives to make sure they're going, and uh, we'll go from there. I uh, needed to order some, uh, some terminal blocks 
And what I'm going with are these DIN rail blocks here, okay? Now, if you don't know what a DIN rail is, here's an, an example in aluminum. And basically this bolts to the inside of your cabinet. And uh, this is effectively a, a compression terminal. And it just clips onto the, uh, onto the DIN rail like that. And it's a positive lock. And uh, you can go ahead and, you know, do individual signals as you like. Or uh, you can use one, something like this, which is basically a compression terminal bus bar that allows you to link a whole bunch of compression terminals together. And uh, I'm going to need to do that uh, for my 5-volt bus, uh, some signal buses, and some commons. Uh, in order to make sure everything terminates correctly on the Acorn controller. Uh, so, I'm going to stop here and do some other things. And when that wire comes in, I will get this all put together on the bench and we'll continue the video. So, yay! This is the bench setup for the centroid air corn. Um, now that I've got all my cables terminated, as you can see right there. Um, I was going great guns, got everything set up and had all kinds of interesting issues because of, guess what? Bad documentation. Um, the schematic supplied for the uh, the lead shine uh, cs d1008 drivers indicates that there are enable lines connected to these uh, enable pins on the connector and if you wire it like that um, it doesn't work it doesn't work at all in fact the uh, power supply makes sounds like something's being shorted when the drives are enabled. Um, and I also get a drive fault error. So I went ahead and posted to the forum about the issue. And through some discussion and some fantastic recommendations or suggestions from the folks on there, it was determined that uh, the... Uh, Enable wires should never be connected. Um, when the driver powers up, it, uh, it's enabled by default. Uh, so uh, these enable lines here shouldn't ever be used. Um, and that left me with uh, an enabled driver, but no motion. Every time I touched it, it would go into a drive fault error on the console and a suggestion was made to remove uh, the drive OK input assignment which is let's see if I can't find that yeah it's these right here okay are going into input 5 and you can see the little table here uh, input 5 is drive OK so I went ahead and I removed that and saved the configuration restarted the controller and lo and behold, the stepper moves. In fact, I'll even see if I can't give you an example of that here. Go one way, we go another way. So, yeah, there's that. Um, so, this left me wondering, was the drive OK wiring correct? Or was there, or was it not? Or was there something else going on? So what I did is I went ahead and I remade the assignment for the drive OK for input five, but I inverted the logic level it expected. And this resulted in it now functioning. So. I had two things going against me, and both were bad documentation. Um, 
invalid schematic and there's no indication as to what uh, that input should be set for uh, for this particular driver and since the schematic is specific to this driver something should have been noted here saying that that should have been set to be inverted and these enable lines never should have been connected so that's where we're at right now um, my next task is to make sure that I've got all my notes good for, for this and then I'm going to start doing a component layout on the, uh, the electronics enclosure that I have. And I think that process will make up the next video. So until next time, sorry for the extra noise, fans kind of loud. <laughs> Anyway, folks, thanks for stopping by. It's appreciated.